Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Letters of Anton and Olga with Dr. Carol Rockamora. As you may have guessed, I am indeed not Carol Rockamora. I am Gavin Reeb. I'm the Artistic Director of the Seagull Project, and I just want to start by thanking everybody who is here. Uh, it is so great to have you uh, supporting us uh, during this odd time uh, and in these new forms. Uh, I will say that um, I am probably about 30 seconds ahead of the, the chat, uh, but we are paying attention to chat. I see people talking. Hello, folks. Feel free to say hi in the chat. I am um, just uh, loving that everybody's here. So thank you for coming through. Um, I'll say that this uh, event uh, is the tail end of our 161st birthday celebration of Anton Chekhov. Anton was born in, on January 29th, and this year we've been celebrating it for about three weeks, which has been wonderful. We've had a, a bunch of fun little releases, some messages from our ensemble, and perhaps the biggest event is happening right now and co uh, continuing into tomorrow when we release I Take Your Hand in Mine, which is partially what we're here to talk about, the love letters of Anton Chekhov and Olga Knipper with our fantastic uh, friends here. Before I introduce them, though, I should also say that we are indeed in the middle of a campaign. It's been going very well, and I want to thank everyone who has donated and continues to support us. Um, we are also continuing that campaign. It is not done yet. We had an incredibly generous gift from a donor uh, of a matching fund of $10,000. What that means basically is that when we hit $10,000 in donations, we get that other $10,000. It's a really nice one-two combo. And we are about $2,000 away from that goal. Um, so if people are interested in giving during this stream or after this stream or when you're listening to the amazing love letters uh, and you're just inspired to give, uh, you can go to our website, www.theseagullproject.org. You can also, uh, there's also a page there that has a uh, address in case you'd rather send a check or something of the like. Uh, so I will also say that there are two major levels of giving. There's a $250 level at which level you get uh, a bottle of wine and two wine glasses that have the Seagull Project logo on them. So you can always think of us when you're drinking. And uh, also at the $500 level, our fantastic friend, uh, Carol Rockamora will sign a copy of I Take Your Hand in Mine, and that will be sent directly to your door. Pretty exciting stuff. Uh, but that's enough about giving and uh, receiving. I'm going to go ahead and first introduce our guest of the evening, uh, a fantastic not only translator, but adapter, producer, uh, teacher, uh, overall fantastic human, someone that has been our guest uh, out here during the Cherry Orchard as well. I'd like to introduce Dr. Carol Rockamora. Carol, you want to join us here? Oh, you're muted, Carol. I'm so sorry. <laughs> here we go. Am I am I with you? You are. You are 100% wonderful. here, Carol. Wonderful. It's an honor and a pleasure to be with you and your fantastic theater company, the most passionate, dedicated company I've ever worked with. And to all your supporters, I am with you 100%. It's an honor and a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. That means so much. You being here means so much. Your continued support over the years, not to mention your fantastic body of work, which we will get into in just a moment as well. Uh, before we're able to do that, though, I got to introduce two other people. Um, first, we'll start with uh, an actress that everybody here, um, for the most part, is well aware of. Uh, she is dynamic. She is fantastic. She is the heart and soul and a co-founder of this company. Everybody, the ever wonderful Julie Briskman. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi, Julie. And joining us today uh, as well, uh, someone who has been in all four of Chekhov's major works with this company, which is quite a feat uh, over like an eight year period, uh, and also a fantastic actor of the screen and stage, uh, Peter Crook, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Peter. Hello. 
I wish we all, I wish I had like an applause backtrack or something <laughs> for when each of you entered. It, we were missing that, but you know, we'll have this same event in like a year and then we could have some real applause. <laughs> Um, wonderful. Thank you all. Uh, so we have everyone's here for uh, a few different reasons. One, because they are all uh, lovers of Chekhov. Uh, I also, Julie and Peter just finished recording a piece that Carol put together called I Take Your Hand in Mine. Um, this is uh, a play suggested by the love letters of Anton Chekhov and Olga Knipper. It's, uh, and I just wanna start with a, a question for Carol about the piece. Uh, you put together this fantastic piece. Uh, we're super aware of how many overall letters Chekhov wrote, not just to Olga. Um, and we've, you know, done some work with the other letters, but none of them really resonate as strongly as the letters that Chekhov sent to Olga. And so, Carol, I'm curious, what brought you to these letters initially? And what made you decide to build I Take Your Hand in Mine? Well, thank you, Gavin. So I had translated all of Chekhov's plays, his full lengths and his one acts. He wrote seven, as everybody knows, seven full length plays. Three of them between us aren't very good, but four <laughs> have been the foundation of modern drama. Of course, The Great Seagull, upon which your company is founded, Uncle Vanya, The Three Sisters, Cherry Orchard. Um, and then I translated, he wrote 11 one acts. I don't know if you're all familiar with the vaudevilles. In any event, um, Olympia Dukakis, who is a New York, a wonderful New York actress, I'm sure you're all familiar with her uh, from stage and screen, suggested, she said, have you ever read the, the correspondence between Anton and Olga? I said, well, I've seen snatches of it. I've seen excerpts from it. She said, well, take a look at it. So I started and I realized this extraordinary story that these 400 letters that they wrote between them, of course, you all know Anton, the great playwright and Olga Knipper, the actress, the leading lady of the Moscow Art Theater wrote between the years of 1898 and 1904 when he died. And what they are, it's so extraordinary. I mean, they're two extraordinary people, uh, great um, pillars of the history uh, of, of Russian theater, et cetera. So it's a story about their love between each other. It's a story about uh, the Moscow Art Theater. It's a story about the times, but it's also a very honest story of a marriage and a love story that so many of us can relate to. So I thought it was fabulous and I'd put it together and uh, uh, Olympia did it, uh, a reading of it with her husband, the late Louis Zorich. And then it, uh, it developed into a, into a full length play, uh, well, hour and 10. But that's <laughs> all it took to tell the story, right, Peter and Julie? That's all it takes. Absolutely, yeah. and. We'll talk a lot. Of, I mean, everyone, most people who are viewing this stream uh, know a thing or two about uh, Anton Chekhov, celebrated playwright, uh, as well as writer of short stories and just about everything um, that this company is built around. Uh, Olga is a lesser known force, but no less impactful on culture, really, when it comes down to it. Uh, Julie, can you just tell us a little bit briefly about about Olga, just from your perspective, having enacted her in this, and because uh, she's just such a strong and fantastic character that we get so we so little we so rarely get to shine light on. Well, she was a very great actress, and th that I think is why he fell in love with her. Um, she was very um, passionate. A little bit of a there's a wonderful picture of her, and she's looking very sort of like this. And, and Chekhov's comment is, yes, but behind those eyes is a minx, you know, so it's like this, but really just the, the naughty underneath. And she was very passionate and very moody and very theatrical. You'll, you'll hear in her letters to him, she's very theatrical, um, not just on the stage. But I mean, she was, she was the leading lady of the Moscow Art Theater. I mean, and all the directors loved her, wanted to be with her um in all the ways and uh yeah so she was a force to be reckoned with she was quite popular in pretty much every way and her acting career continues well beyond Chekhov's lifetime into 
uh, basically the mid 20th century. Like she she goes on to have a very long and fantastic career uh, and continues to play these roles that she originates. It's uh, truly a, an artistic uh, love that that maintains well beyond life, which is so gorgeous. And she never remarried after he died. And that that's something that's always really struck me, the devotion between them. And they were only together four years. Is that right, Carol? Six years, actually. Six years. 98 through 04. But I and think she had a lot of guilt, which of course is revealed in the play. I don't want to Yes, I don't want to give that away. (laughs) No, I know because I learned so much about her from this play that it was like, oh, oh, that happened. Oh, I had things that I did not know until you revealed them to me. And that was very exciting and interesting. But she outlived him by about 50 years. Indeed. Well, you, know, you know, every as everybody who's tuned in knows who's married, every marriage has a secret and it's not always revealed, but it's suggested. And I think that's really why I sat down, Gavin, to answer your question, to write this play, because there is a very important event. Again, no spoiler in this six year marriage, which is a mystery never quite solved, but it is the dramatic heart of the piece. And they stayed together and they loved each other very much, even though they had a commuter marriage, so to speak, which I'm sure many people on this Zoom have as well. Well, especially in a pandemic, Lord (laughs) knows. Uh, (laughs) um, Thank you for that. Uh, Carol, so as you mentioned, the working with Olympia, uh, putting this piece together was kind of the beginning of it. And since then, it's had a pretty cool life. Uh, Can you just tell us a little bit about some of your favorite stops? For this well, piece. My, I think the greatest honor was it was done in 2001 at the Almeida Theater in London in a temporary space called King's Cross. But it was done by the late uh, great Irene Worth and Paul Schofield. She was 85 years old and he was 80. It was extraordinary. But of course, they did two readings of it. It was great the first time. But the second time, Irene was starting to rewrite the play (laughs) as she was reading it. Anyway, that was a great honor. Um, Then it was picked up by Peter Brook. I'm sure everybody on the Zoom has heard of Peter Brook, the great British director who has his own theater company in Paris. He put on for three years a French language production starring the late, great Michel Piccoli, who's a wonderful screen and stage actor and his wife, Natasha Perry, both of whom unfortunately are no longer with us. And that was a great honor. It was done at Théâtre des Bouffes du Nord in Paris. It was toured all over Europe. It went back to the Théâtre des Champs-Élysées. This is all in French. And then it went to London. But since then, I I say this with all humility, it's not because of me, it's because of their story, this love story. This, This little play has been done all over the world. It's been done in Beijing, it's done, been done in Moscow, it's been done in Madrid, in Valencia, in Rome, in Turin, in Athens, in Oslo, Mexico City, Lima. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's really had quite a life. Bogota, uh, New York City, and Seattle. <laughs> <laughs> Has there been an online version yet? We were the first audio version, I think, <laughs> oh, maybe, Carol? Uh, I don't know. You know, Kevin <laughs> Klein and Diane Weiss did it in um, in New York, and I don't know if they recorded it or not. Mm-hmm. But I'm so glad and I'm thrilled you're doing it with these two fabulous actors. Oh. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it feels an honor just to continue to walk in the shoes of the or in the footsteps of the piece, because that's that's a fantastic. I mean, it's not just the piece itself, right? That is that is a fantastic journey. But walking in the the the, the footsteps that the play also follows of these two fantastic and impactful artists and the beautiful and complicated but deep, deep love that they shared. And, and of course, remember that he wrote letters all the time. She wrote letters because she knew that they would be famous after they were both gone. So there's a little <laughs> bit of disingenuousness there, but he, he wrote, he wrote 4,000 letters in his lifetime. Thank God he didn't have a telephone till after he wrote Uncle Vanya, right? Right, yeah. Or Zoom, yeah. <laughs> or, Zoom yeah. <laughs> or, Zoom or text, think of it. <laughs> 
I mean, I mean, we probably have some contemporary great writers that are that we will be compiling their text messages, hopefully for good reasons in the future. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and and the story of of Chekhov's letters are interesting too because they were protected by his sister, right, Carol, and kind yeah. of maintained throughout her life. And that's how one of the reasons why we are able well, because for people who don't know, during the Soviet era in Russia, a lot of literature and letters written during that period were hidden and, and only released till in, you know, uh, after the, the fall. And uh, it was and so the, the history of letters and literature in Russia is is one with a lot of gaps in it. And so that's one of the reasons why I say we're fortunate to have someone like uh, Chekhov's sister, who, yes, her name is Masha. Masha and we sure. don't need to get into the psychology of why right. there's so many right. characters named Masha in his plays. Right. But <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think we're very fortunate to have these letters. Um, Carol, so you've probably translated slash adapted more of the work of Chekhov than any, certainly for theater, than any American. Uh, which is, I think, a pretty high, like, amazing thing to have. Have yeah. I mean, wow, it's incredible. And uh, I guess my question is, what what initially brought you to this work? Why do you keep coming back to it? What is it about this writer that has you so fascinated? Well, I I was fortunate. I had I have a PhD in Russian literature, so I speak the language. But I didn't use it for years, and then. A, an actor named Richard Jenkin, I don't know if you know who he is, who used to run Trinity Rep. He, out of the blue, he heard that I was a Russian, had been a Russian scholar in a former life. He asked me to translate the seagull. And I was running a theater company at the time in Philadelphia for new plays. And I started translating this, this play, The Seagull, and I was hooked and I never stopped. I quit mm -hmm. my job as the artistic director for a theater company to translate Chekhov. Um, I think he's a lot like Shakespeare. Once you get in, marinate in the work, it's a whole world, as I'm sure Julie and Peter know, and of course, Gavin, you know, and all the members of your wonderful company. He is so rich. And he, and remember, he wrote only seven full-length plays. He's written 588 short stories. And they're in a way, a, a sort of a working, a, 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 a rich pool of resource from which the plays have sprung. So, and I've, I've uh, adapted quite a number of those stories and I hope your company will do them someday as well. Yeah, I have, uh, I think I have most, most of your books right next to me, actually, Carol. So they they very okay. rarely leave my look at Julie pointing right okay. there. I see both <laughs> volumes of the rubles. I see all of the major plays. I see I take your hand in mine, of course. I see your uh, it, uh, a life in four acts uh, yeah. biography. So you better believe that we are <laughs> shouting from the rooftops how amazing you are. No, no, no not at all. We also have in chat, I see uh, people celebrating a production of, of I Take Your Hand in Mine at Oregon Shakespeare Festival about 15 years ago, uh, wow. which is also very cool. Um, that's Great. our local, you know, wonderful classical company of the Northwest, right? We have one, a lot of wonderful classical companies here in Seattle as well, not to do that. But um, yeah, that's, that's great to hear. Thank you, Dwayne, for passing that along. And thank you, Carol. Um, I think since we're we're hitting so folks in the audience, um, we plan to wrap this up by six. We're we want to keep everything contained for you on this Friday night, um, and uh, and if you have questions, uh, you can be putting them in the chat. And we have someone who is compiling them all for a, a, a question and answer session at the end. Those can be for Carol. They could be for Peter, Julie, myself. You know, you could just ask them to check off in a great into the void kind of way. But um, uh, but we're also going to uh, have a little bit of a reading from I Take Your Hand in Mine, which we're going to do right now at about the halfway point. Um, so we've selected a, a scene uh, from just towards the beginning of this, and I'll set it up. Um, Carol and I are going to turn our cameras off to create the nice intimacy uh, of... Uh, uh, there we go, of Anton and Olga uh, just on the screen. And I'll just set this up briefly. Uh, they just met. Uh, Anton and Olga meet uh, when 
Chekhov's play, The Seagull, <laughs> is uh, solicited by the Moscow Art Theater. They have a first reading, a very famous first reading. And if you were following along with our birthday campaign, you may have seen uh, all of those famous actors adorned with little birthday hats uh, at that famous first reading, including Olga and Anton. Uh, and they, and as soon as he locks eyes with her, he, they basically fall in love. And they meet each other a couple more times. He calls on her. She meets his mother, uh, which is a big step here. And um, they have just begun their correspondence when we enter <laughs> this scene. At the time, he was building his house in Yalta. His doctors were banishing him to the south, and he had to leave his beloved Melikovo. The consumption was progressing. She was rehearsing in Moscow. I journeyed south to Yalta on the train. You've only been gone four days, and already I need to write you. I know it's too soon, but I can't help myself. Saturday evening, my favorite. The sound of the church bells is so peaceful. You sentimental German, you. I was so sad at the station when you left. I felt like crying all the way home. Your sister was here yesterday. How nice of her. Checking up on you. How was the journey? Fine. Fine. My companions let me take the lower berth. I ate everything in the basket. No boiling water on the train for tea, though. Arrived at my house in Yalta late last evening. It's so quiet here. I sat indoors thinking of you. My dear actress, if only you knew what pleasure your letters give me. I bow low before you. Very low. <laughs> so low, in fact, that my brow touches the bottom of a well eight fathoms deep. Thanks for the photographs and the sweets, and for your letters, too. I was so distraught, I thought you didn't want to write to me. This morning, we rehearsed Uncle Vanya. Tonight, I play Arkadina in The Seagull. Stanislavski can't come to Vanya rehearsals. He's directing Ivan the Terrible. How is he going to play Astrov if he's not at rehearsals? Well, good luck. He's not a bad director, but he's a terrible actor. Why don't you write more often? Don't you feel the need? Nothing to write about. It's so lonely and dull here. I feel I've been living in Yalta a million years. Today I caught two mice. I press your hand in mine, busy actress. Don't forget me. October 26, 1899, opening night of Uncle Vanya. I was so excited. Was I all right in Act Four? <laughs> You're an unusual man, unique. We'll never see each other again, so why hide it? I was attracted to you in a way. Go then, finita la commedia. I'm keeping this pencil as a remembrance. <laughs> Brava, dear actress. <laughs> Sounds wonderful to me. How they loved it. I telegrammed right after the performance. I know, they rang me. I ran to the phone in the dark, barefoot. God, the floor was cold. <laughs> then hardly had I gotten back into bed when it rang again. The only time in my life when my own fame kept me awake. I was terrible. Abominable. The play was a, was a success. The audience raved, and what do I do? I act appallingly. Had to take valerian drops to calm myself. You have no idea how it feels to know you're acting badly. You wrote that yourself, remember? You're overreacting. Really, you are. A few bad performances are no reason to feel low. Art especially the theater, is a world you cannot enter without stumbling over the threshold. There are many days of failure ahead, whole seasons even. Things will go badly. You will have huge heartbreak. 
but you must prepare for it, expect it, and follow your path. Come see me. I need you. Be calm, dear actress. Success has spoiled you. Ordinary, everyday life just isn't good enough. How I suffer for my work. One day I'm up, the next day I'm down. For the love of God, write! I write you so often that it's hurting my pride. I must treat my little actress more severely and not write to her. Be well, my angel. I kiss your little hand. I envy the coat you wear every day. I feel so low. It's awful. But why? You're alive, you're working, you have hopes. What more could you want? Look at me. I'm uprooted from my native soil. I don't drink, though I love to. I like noise and there's none here. I'm like a transplanted tree. Do I wither away and die? No. I rage with jealousy. I envy the rat that lives under your theater's floor. New Year's Eve. Tonight we played Uncle Vanya. 1900. Imagine the centennial. Happy New Year, my remarkable actress. There was thunderous applause. It was thrilling. We're taking it to Petersburg. How I wish I could see it. It's cold here. Cold and quiet as the grave. Write to me, please. I'm so bored. I feel as if I'm in a prison. Come to Yalta in the spring to celebrate the centennial, why don't you? We're coming. In April, the whole company's coming. We'll bring the set of Uncle Vanya. We'll perform it especially for you. Dear actress, it's March at last. Lilies, irises, hyacinths are all in bloom. The willow is blossoming. The grass around the bench is lush and luxuriant. The almond tree flowers. All nature is expecting you. I've put benches everywhere in preparation for your arrival. Wooden ones, which I've painted green myself. <laughs> I'm planting palms. How wonderful. We'll be in Yalta at Easter time. That means we'll see each other so soon. We've taken off our galoshes and go out only in hats now. I haven't heard a note of music since autumn. Will you? You will bring the music. We came in April. It was like a festival. We arrived in Yalta and were strewn with flowers. We performed Uncle Vanya for him. Rachmaninoff was there and Gorky, Bunin and Kuprin, Tolstoy too. It was glorious. Every moment of it I treasured. Lunches, dinners, parties till all hours. I entertained them day and night. We swarmed all over his little house, sat in his study, wandered in his almond orchard. A whirlwind of life and laughter and hope. We left the swing and bench from Vanya in his garden. Must you leave so soon? We must. The Petersburg Spring Tour. You know. I came to Moscow soon thereafter. It was so empty in Yalta after they'd gone. I couldn't bear it. But he was not feeling well, so back he went. In June, I journeyed by train to Yalta, to the wonderful, luxuriant South. The gentle sun, the scent-laden air. We're traveling in a carriage with two large Armenian ladies. I'm counting the miles. She arrived in early July. The azaleas were in bloom. In July, we became lovers. Amazing. Oh, gosh. Wonderful job, you two. Thank you so much. Um, uh, <clears throat> 
I guess I would just like to encourage the people on our YouTube to just put up their their applause in the chat. <laughs> we do appreciate that. I will pass it along uh, personally to Peter and Julie. Um, that was wonderful, you two. Thank you so much. Carol, you're welcome to join us as well. Um, there. There she is. There we go. Hello. Bravo. Bravo. Thank you, Carol. Wonderful. Um, that's that's wonderful. And so things really just take off from there. And there's so much beautiful language throughout it. You can he's he he constantly walks that line of, you know, and it's it's all over his all of his work, right? Of of like kind of shruggily com comedifying everything, but also having this just pure depth to him. Exactly. Well, and you know, just so, uh, oh, sorry. No, so please, please, Carol. Just to remind our audience, in, during these six years, Chekhov uh, went from an invalid to a serious invalid, and then he died. Whereas she, she was 38 when they met, he was 29, whereas she was young and vibrant. So it, during that trajectory, he did write two plays, The Three Sisters and The Cherry Orchard. So it was a hugely rich time professionally for both of them. She was performing in all his plays. But what I think is so beautiful and what Julie and Peter captured so wonderfully is just the little detail, the quotidian detail of their lives. You mm -hmm. know, mentions of the weather and dentist appointments and toothaches and clothes and money and debt and little food and presents for mama juxtaposed against these huge events in the theater and in his life uh, descending toward death. So that's the beauty of it, I think. And you, you did it so beautifully, Peter and Julie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, we do have applause coming through the chat, by the way. So just sharing that with everyone. Uh, and folks, I just once again want to encourage you, please feel free to use the chat. We love hearing from folks. We love seeing you have conversations around this work. Um, I think that's one of the great things about these new platforms is that uh, it, there's a different way that we can all activate. So feel free to just keep chatting. Um, so, you know, Peter and Julie uh, and I have been working on Take Your Hand in Mine in one way or another since August. Uh, we recorded it at Jack Straw uh, Cultural Center in September uh, and, uh, and we're aiming for a, a Valentine's Day release. It will release officially tomorrow. Um, I know, right? Right? Um, <laughs> uh, and Julie has, uh, has also read some of these love letters um, at various Great Souls and Zakuski events since our founding. Um, I also want to encourage anyone to let us know if you have heard us read these outside of the context of I Take Your Hand in Mine at any of these events. Put it in the chat. We'd love to hear your stories or your memories about that because they're fleeting for us, but um, we love when you can light them up. Um, we're obviously in different circumstances now where uh, reading love letters together is a little more difficult. Um, but uh, I was just curious, uh, Julie and Peter, if you could talk a little bit about the experience recording these um, under the current circumstances and, and, you know, what it was like to be in the studio together and to engage with these in a different way, especially when we've spent so, so long away from one another. Uh, I'll just toss it over to you to talk about your experience working on these. You go, Peter. I, uh, I first of all, thank you for um, this experience of, of this piece. Uh, each time we do it, there's more uh, that hits my heart so strongly. Um, uh, the, one of the takeaways that I found rehearsing this in this medium making sure you're not muted and making sure your camera is on and your light is working and, and your notes and your script are in front of you and everything is uh, blended. Um, the rehearsing, we had uh, some great give and take, but the, low, the sound would overlap. So you'd have to stop and go back. But in a rehearsal, you, miss, you, you, can, over, you can talk over each other. Uh, and sometimes uh, we do ad infinitum. And, uh, but getting into the studio in our masks, <laughs> our, our headsets came off, our masks came off. We were separate, Julie and I. Gavin was in a separate booth. Our lovely engineer was in a separate booth. And Julie and I were free to play. 
in that space with these beautiful words and these events in these letters, this correspondence that, as Carol says, goes through life and death, death being very much a part of this life together with them. Um, and it was so remarkable to stand there at a mic and look over at my colleague, my artist friend, the person who is the reason I'm here, um, and, uh, and my Valentine this year, um, and, and, and share these, these uh, play, just play with each other. And I think um, we finished it and Gavin said, I think we got what we need. And, uh, um, and uh, I, I just, I felt like we did it. At, and then something just went, we missed having an audience. Mm. I missed having an audience. It was that thing of we did it, but something's missing. And that's what it occurred to me then. And hopefully through this tonight with this and you all out there that we have made that connection. We've connected that circuit. And, uh, and I look forward to, um, to, to connecting it in, in, in real time with real people. So I, I, it's a journey taking this and I'm, uh, um, I take your hand in mine and I, 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 accept, I accept the journey, I accept the ticket. Julie, thank you. Oh my gosh, thank, I, don't start. Peter, crook. I said we're doing all four plays because I'm not going anywhere until Mr. Peter Crook plays Uncle Vanya. So that's how that goes. I love you. Here we did it. <clears throat> yeah, I can't, we've talked about um, how excited we are to get this out in the world this way, which is great. But the fact that we can take it all over the place, Carol, <laughs> and just do it everywhere and do it from big spaces to people's living rooms. I just cannot wait. Absolutely. You don't need anything. Two chairs, maybe. That's right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I also, uh, uh, yeah, th thank you. Thank you for those answers. That was that was incredibly well uh, said, Peter, that that gap that exists and how we're seeking to find ways to, to fill it right now. And it's and it's so difficult, but so necessary. And we we continue to you know, maybe we're recreating it. Maybe it's not the same, but it exists out there. And um, I don't know. I just, I don't know. I just feel that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I recognize that it is uh, 543. So I just want, I have a couple quick questions for Carol, and then I want to save some time for questions from anyone who is in our beloved YouTube audience. Um, so uh, Carol, I think the first thing I have for you, and this might be a, well, I guess, uh, so we talked a little bit about this briefly about the, the the incredible complexity of Chekhov because he seems to exist in two different worlds of comedy and drama to contemporary audiences, although he would certainly say that he existed in a comedic vein. Um, but do you have an approach to translating his work when you when you go to it? Because the one thing I really that really sticks out with yours is that it exists in that space between. You know, I've read... Um, uh, I've read translations that really go into the comedic and it just doesn't work as it's just shtick, you know, and then I've read them that treat them entirely like tragedy, which obviously, obviously is not the right way either. So I don't, I just love to hear a little bit about how, how your approach to this work, how you do it. I, I, I feel my responsibility as a translator is to be faithful to the original. And the language is just beautiful. It's simple. It's rich. It's colorful, it's musical, and it's light. That's the key. And th this is a man who was, until he was 20, uh, when he was 24, had his first coughing fit and uh, the first signs of consumption. So he was an invalid for the rest of his life till 44, and yet he maintained that lightness. And that's what comes out in the writing, the humor, the light humor, and underneath, as, as Peter and Julie point out, these great fathoms and depths. So I think a translator, you just have to go with the flow of the language. There's a definite rhythm to it. Um, for example, when, uh, I'll just give you an example, and may, there may be Russian speakers in the audience tonight, I hope so. Um, so if you have a sentence like, uh, you know, you have that rhythm over and over and over again. So I would try to say, she's so good, she's so kind, she's so blah, 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 blah. 
um, rather than paraphrase. So I hope I, I hope I served him well. Mm. But I think, I think the key to Chekhov is the lightness, is the comedy, because there's so much darkness. And um, there's a word, Chekhovian. I always ask my students, what is Chekhovian? And no one knows how to translate it, but they know what it is. And it's that combination, the symbiosis of light and dark, of comedy and serious and tragedy. So. That's fantastic. Um, and just to say that we read, you know, before we started with the seagull, um, and I think Carol knows this, we read every translation uh, <laughs> there was to read. And <laughs> it was very, very clear that um, the life of your translations and the immediacy and everything mm -hmm. you're talking about, we could, we could feel exactly what you're talking about. So um, that's also a, a reason we value you so much. Oh, I'm very honored. Thank you. I also think there's a great importance in you being American, to be honest, because I, I read a lot of British translations and they just understand class. Their uh, um, approach to class is different than in America and also very different than in Russia. And I often feel that American, because uh, we, because America, we're really known for the sarcastic, uh, dripping with irony kind of thing. And um, not that everywhere else isn't in one way or another, but it's just a different way. And I think there's something, it didn't feel like you were playing into that kind of, those kind of British qualities or anything. It was, it feels purely American. It feels like it, 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 it well, Russian and American, right? It feels like it exists in a different frame. And I, I don't know, that's just because it's you and it's just you writing what you feel in there. Um, but I just, I wanna celebrate that because um, it, it it feels, you know, all at once working class and, and a struggle and full, but also just, but it also still has, you know, the Gaevs and the, uh, and the Arkadnas and, and all of these, these rich characters, both in literal physical wealth and, uh, and in writing. So. It, do you know what I would do? I would, I would cheat. I would go, um, if, if we were looking at a few at a time, I would, I would go to the speeches <laughs> and particularly if it was something I was going to be saying. And it was like, no, well, this is the one. This is the one. Because there's an immediacy. It's not, um, it's not chilly. It's passionate. It is well, that's him. That's yes, him. it is what it is. He says what he means. Yeah. You know, so um, yeah, you're just yeah. Well, we just we adore you. So yes. Oh, well, we adore you. Thank you. <laughs> Chekhov loves you. And it's his birthday, and to hear you read it on his birthday. Yes. The Russians love birthday parties. Yes. Name, yeah, the name days. Yes, indeed. Uh, as we know from the top of three sisters. Yeah. Um, folks, we're, we're getting, we're creeping towards the end here, and I want to really respect Carol's time. Um, so we're going to do a quick, I see you, Carol, but we're going to respect your time. Um, okay. <laughs> um, you're, you're, on, you're on the East Coast. It's a whole different world. Um, but um, I want to, we're gonna have a, a, a question and answer session here in just a moment. Um, I'm gonna lead us through a toast, uh, a birthday toast uh, for Mr. Chekhov. Um, but I wanna let everyone in chat know this is a great time to start posing any questions you might have for Carol, large or small. It can be about her experiences uh, with this, can be experiences with any of the plays, a question about Chekhov in general. This is a, your chance to really um, answer question, uh, ask a question to someone who, uh, knows knows this this work better than pretty much any American, not to mention most pretty much anyone across the world. So, um, not to put any pressure on Carol there, but I know I know how amazing you are. Yeah, you're like I know I am. Come on. Um, <laughs> um, so everyone, go ahead and put those in the chat. But I would also love, uh, and I think we'll go uh, uh, Peter, Julie, Carol, and I'll finish it off. But if we could each just do a quick birthday toast to check off, I I have my little. Ye old uh, Zakuski seagull glass. <laughs> Folks, if you in the audience want to join our toasting, you are welcome to. It is a Friday night okay. after all. Um, so, uh, Carol, we're going to have to send you one of these. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, <laughs> oh my God, um, yes. <laughs> but uh, uh, Peter, would you like to, to start to start off the, the wishes? I'd be honored. 
<laughs> to Dr. Chekhov, the artist, the lover, the soul who understood that through sickness and loss and separation, the only cure is the theater. Opuskai. Opuskai. <laughs> <laughs> to beloved Anton, my hero, and to Carol Rockamora for bringing him to us. Opuskai. <laughs> Thank you. Is it my turn? So I say, Dr. Chekhov, you once said that you only had a few more years to live, and after that you would be forgotten. Please know you are not forgotten, nor will you ever be. Thank you for the gift you have given us. And I'll build on this. This is to the great doctor, the great writer, the humanitarian, the man who always, uh, whether it was building a school in a little community or going to tend to TB victims in Siberia or creating one of the first massive prison um, censuses uh, in, uh, uh, in Eastern Russia, someone whose heart has always been about people first and about his great love of them. And so this is to the people who continue to carry that message on, whether it's through translating or uh, carrying on his words or just carrying it in our heart. So this is to the great legacy of uh, a great artist, but also more so to everyone who has a part in maintaining that legacy. So thank you all. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Oh my God, that was wonderful. Y'all are going to make me cry. I know. <laughs> um, and laugh. And laugh at the same that's time. That's right. Right, right. Yeah. I always, people are always like, so what's like, what's up with Chekhov? Why do you like that? And I'm always like, well, he's the only player who has ever made me laugh and cry at the same time. <laughs> um, and y'all do it too. Uh, so thank you. Uh, I, uh, okay, great, great, great. I am just pulling up some questions. And in the meantime, okay, awesome. Uh, I want to also remind everyone that uh, we are in the middle of a campaign uh, and that we would love any, I say they're gifts to Chekhov because we are uh, a, a, one of the the big Chekhov companies, you know, and we continue to try and carry on his legacy. And so if you want to give Chekhov a 161st birthday gift, uh, <laughs> you are more than welcome to do that in a form of a donation to the Seagull Project. Um, and we would greatly appreciate that. Once again, you've seen how uh, brilliant Carol is. And if you want uh, a signed copy of I Take Your Hand in Mine, uh, then you can give it the $500 level, $250, and we get you uh, that wine in the glasses. Uh, but you can also give it any level. We appreciate it so much. We're so close to that matching goal. And regardless, I, I want to let all of our donors know how much we appreciate you. There's like 50 people watching right now, and that's wonderful. Uh, you're taking time on a Friday to hear us talk about love letters. Um, thank you so much for all of that. Um, uh, all right, I do have some questions here, so let's get to these. Um, oh, uh, we have, uh, uh, this is for Carol. What were some of the responses in, uh, oh, say, sorry. Oh, um, was were all of the letters in Russian, or were there other languages mixed in there as well, Carol? No, they were all they were they were all in Russian. Only Chekhov would crack jokes in German because Olga was of German descent, so he used to call her "my little Knipperschutz," <laughs> and he would he would pepper it with little German sayings. But yeah, they were all in Russian. Probably a little a couple and French they were words mixed funny. in. Funny, they were so funny and she she took herself so seriously because again she knew how famous he was and she knew once she married him that her letters would be published but he was always so light and as sick as he was um he never lost that sense of humor thank you 
uh, uh, next next question. Did Chekhov address her as actress in all of his letters? We just heard that a lot in this Mila initial correspondence. Actrisa. Mila Actrisa. Well, he called her my little doggy, my little horsey. My, he, his favorite was in Russian, Krinolinchik, which is my little crinoline, my little uh, fancy dress. So he had all kinds of names for her. And she would say, she'd get really mad at him. Again, a very, very serious thing happened when they were about married a year and a half. Again, no spoiler. Uh, re, uh, I hope you'll see the play and you'll know what happens. And he would just try to crack jokes and make light of it. And uh, it would annoy her, but of course she adored him, so. I know a few relations like that, yeah. Yes, exactly. Uh <laughs> like all of our relationships, yes. Uh, this next question is from uh, Rob Whitmer, who is the fantastic composer and musician who, along with Brandon Romans, did the music for our version of I Take Your Hand in Mine, oh, as well as having worked on all of our productions in one way or another. Um, if Yalta was a city in the U.S., what would it be? <laughs> right. Uh, well, it was Yalta is, uh, oh, my goodness. Like Florida, Palm maybe somewhere in Florida um, yeah, or Palm maybe Springs. The, or Maybe the west coast of Florida. Yeah, not, like Palm Springs. Nancy, not the East Coast, the West Coast of Florida, maybe. Yes. Oh, the West Coast of Florida. I but see. He, yeah, it's like Tampa Bay or something. Bob <laughs> hated Yalta because he, he couldn't write without the, the Russian birch trees. And there were palm trees. And mm -hmm. it drove him crazy, as, as Julie and, and Peter know from some of the letters. You know, it, it, it's so hot here. Uh, there is no wind. The sea is swelling, people are drowning, I'm so bored, you know, <laughs> and all these palm trees. But he really missed the North. Yeah, and when, when he finally went, she had to take him to uh, the South, to Badenweiler in Germany while he was dying. And they were in a hotel room. And of course, this is in the play, Julian Peter will, will perform it for you. And he kept on having to change the room he wanted to get a view of the trees. Of course, there were no birch trees there. I guess there were firs in 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 uh, um, in, the, in Baden Baden in southwest Germany. But that was such Russia was such an important part of his his uh, his his lifeblood, his creativity, the north and the seasons. Yeah, yeah he certainly expresses himself and his feelings about it throughout the letters. Yeah. Um, uh, did did Anton write roles with Olga in mind ever? Uh, okay. I know this, this. They say I know he met her after writing Arkadna. Were any roles written for her? Yes, he wrote Masha for her in the Three Sisters, and then of course he wrote um, Lyubov Andreevna in uh, the Cherry Orchard for her. Uh, but you know what? When when they cast the seagull. He had, it had already been done. He didn't want her to play it because he felt she was too young. She was 29. He said, she's supposed to be 42 years old. And Julie, she said, uh-uh, I'm playing it, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes, and you can pry yeah. that role out of my cold, dead hands. <laughs> uh, exactly. exactly. For the future, just saying. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> And if people think that Julie is joking, she is not. No, I am not. <laughs> and I have, I have, it's not the first time she has said that to me. Nope. And it's not, not even jokingly in front of an audience. Like Gavin is a producer and artistic director of this company. It's a threat. Okay. So yeah. be careful. Well, yeah. when Olga was in her 80s, in her early 80s, she couldn't perform on the stage anymore. So once she went to a performance of um, the Three Sisters, and there was another actress reciting in the cove by the sea, et cetera, et cetera and she didn't like it, she stood up in the audience and shouted out the lines. Cool. That was her role. It the Maya role, so. Wow. Ooh, wow. That's, <laughs> yeah. uh, just two last questions and then we'll uh, we'll walk the road towards wrapping things up. But um, this is maybe, I, I, we'll see how you want to answer this one, Carol. Uh, can you give example an example of a badly translated line compared to some of your great ones? Maybe this is a Peter and Julie <laughs> question. No, no, I, I respect, I respect all my colleagues. Um, many of my, co but there are two kinds of versions. When you go to the bookstore, there are two kinds of versions in English. There are translations and then there are adaptations. So uh, many of my colleagues, wonderful, wonderful writers, Tom Stoppard, David Hare, Richard Nelson, great, great writers have adapted, but they've never heard the language. 
So I'm not criticizing it. I'm just saying it's different than if you know, if you can hear the Russian. Yeah. 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 I've, it, sorry, did someone, or was that me bouncing back? Okay. I heard myself bouncing back. Um, yeah. I think, I always think it's very, really interesting to uh, that, just that, that difference and that how many translators there are in America that uh, are translating from other translations and obviously things get lost in that double translation. Yes, yes. And it, it's very, I mean, I don't blame theater companies if they want to sell tickets. Who wouldn't want to see the seagull translated by David Mamet? You know, that's an exciting name, right? Um, but it's not the rush, it's not from the original. So it's different. Peter, do you have something? I just wanted to add that we were very fortunate, are very fortunate to have in our company uh, a member who speaks Russian, translates back and forth between English and uh, um, Russian. And he was an, um, is an amazing resource, Tyler Polomsky, to um, see it on the page and you read it on the page and you hear it in your own head and then ask him to say it in the, in the Russian. And then you realize, oh, it's not what as it sounds in English, it's sto, as it is in Russian. So sto is a different way to say what than right. what. <laughs> so he, he, and that's the tiniest portion of that, but he would read whole passages. And you were saying earlier about the rhythm and the breaks and the rhythm. And, the, and that's how it's like Shakespeare too. And in many ways, the silences are also um, uh, very poetic. So uh, I just wanted to say thank you to Tyler for also being part of this whole adventure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, last uh, question, and maybe a good one to kind of send us off uh, it with inspiration before I share one last thing. Um, Carol, do you have any favorite authors? So we have we have a Great Souls uh, series, which we is we celebrate the legacy of Chekhov through short stories, and we read uh, contemporary ones, um, you know, ones that are older than Chekhov, but we feel that they are in conversation with the works of Anton Chekhov and. We also have a podcast version of it. If people want to check it out, you're welcome to uh, do that. I'll send a link in a moment. Uh, but Carol, do you have any favorite authors who you feel were influenced by Chekhov? Oh, so many. I mean, Beckett, it, it, there's a direct line. The existentialists owe so much to Chekhov. Mm -hmm. that, that act three speech when Chibotichin says, maybe I don't even exist. Remember, mm -hmm. he gets drunk. He says... I'm a doctor, I know nothing. Maybe I don't even exist at all. Um, so that all the great existentialists owe a, a, a debt to Chekhov. Uh, I mentioned Richard Nelson, so many, uh, uh, Brian Friel, uh, so many great contemporary American and British authors have been inspired by him. Even Woody yeah. Allen. <laughs> Absolutely. That's and a great you know, you... movie. That's a great movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that uh, I, it's hard to find a contemporary contemporary writer who is not some way influenced by him, whether they know it or exactly. not. <laughs> I was I, I wanted to ask Carol. Um, just brought us brought this up, but it, his, so his influence moved west. Did it go further east uh, to China and and the, the other rest of Asia and Japan? I mean, has it been translated there as well and done there as, as well? You know, I. I, I have a, a colleague had, has produced this play, I Take Your Hand in Mine, with two famous TV actors in China and take it all over China. They know mm -hmm. Chekhov, they love mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. So he's, he writes about, he says, I write about life as it is. That's mm -hmm. his quote. And he writes about what it means to be a human being. All the joys and sorrows of life, the foolishness of life, the ecstasy, all of it. So, uh, yes, the answer is yes. <laughs> well, then we're going to have to uh, continue to, that's one thing. It's like we always have to make sure that we're trying to take in the different interpretations around the world because they help feed us too, which is yes. wonderful. Um, one last thing I want to give. This is our gift to our audience for uh, tuning in tonight. Uh, I am posting right now in the YouTube 
a link to I Take Your Hand in Mine. Uh, it has not yet actually been released. Uh, it's here. I'll put it in our chat too here to make sure that I want Carol to have it, obviously. <laughs> um, uh, to, um, so this is not, we have not yet technically released this. Uh, we are releasing it tomorrow, but I wanted uh, all of our fantastic patrons, ensemble members, friends who have joined us tonight to have a sneak peek. Uh, you can head over. It's totally free. Uh, and that, by the way, it's freedom is also a testament to uh, Carol and uh, um, and her team being so incredibly generous and kind with us. Thank you, Carol. Oh, um, uh, and so, but folks, please enjoy it. Listen to it. Um, it's really gorgeous. It's a wonderful thing to just put on in the background, you know, while you're enjoying your Valentine's Day. I'm sure it'll spice things up for you a bit. So that's... <laughs> the <laughs> So we put a lot of work into it and we're so happy to be able to release it for free uh, to all of our fantastic patrons, uh, share it far and wide. Uh, I'll obviously put out some information about it as the week progresses, but I just wanted to use it as a way to, to thank everybody who came out to join us here. Uh, so that's in the chat. I'll also send a follow up to everybody who RSVP'd and our donors uh, who who donated during this campaign to make sure you have it as well. So just thank you so much, everybody. I, I hope you enjoy it. We enjoyed making it. Um, and I guess I just I'll, I'll give everyone just a little bit of space here to, to say something final before we uh, say our goodbye to Carol for now. I'm sure we will see a lot more of Carol in our future. It's inevitable. Um, but why don't we go Julie Peter and then Carol uh, and then I'll, uh, I'll close us up. Just thank you everybody so much. We love you. And as you know, we, we could do absolutely nothing without you. And thank you so much for seeing us through this really challenging time. It means the absolute world to us. So thank you. I want to echo that. Thank you. And uh, say thank you to all of our sponsors and patrons, the people who've stayed with us over the years and look and made us work harder and str be funnier and faster. And, <laughs> and I look forward to the next few years with this, uh, this company and the, the great things we have in store. So I'll see you all at the theater. Yes. And thank you so much for uh, supporting this amazing theater company. It's dedication, it's passion, it's fierceness, it's tenacity, and it's love for the theater is unparalleled. Bravo. Carol, Carol, uh, I love you so much. Uh, I, I, wish you were, I wish we were not in a pandemic so you could be here and I could give you a big hug because I would do it. Absolutely. Uh, I'll, I'll just say yes. I'll just echo it. Thank you, everybody. I, I, I just I can't I can't express how how thankful we are that we we're having this campaign right now. And this campaign is making it so that we can we can bridge the rest of this gap and and create theater in in the future and it, it just means so much to us that you support and that you continue to give and that you that you find that our work and the work of anton chekhov and our continual strive of this company to do better and better and better at that work uh that it's important to you so just thank you for supporting theater thank you for supporting the arts uh, thank you for continuing to be a humanitarian in whatever it way it may be during these these really difficult times. And and thank you to Carol um, for, I mean, honestly, I don't know if we would be here. Well, we certainly wouldn't having this conversation right now, but I don't know if we wouldn't we wouldn't be here if 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 uh, someone at Trinity Rep hadn't asked you to adapt the, to oh, translate the seagull years ago. And the, the the American theater and the world theater is so much better for it. I really, really mean that. And we are so much better for it. And we have had better conversations. We have had, uh, we have united with our patrons and our ensemble. And a lot of that is because of you. Uh, so oh, just thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I'm going to uh, close down the stream. Uh, I just, once again, a lot of love to everybody out there. Thank you for tuning in. And uh, we'll see you at the theater. Uh, feel free to, to make any donations if you would like. Um, and we will... We'll see you very soon.